In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, I'm not sure that we made this very clear to you all, but you know, during these four Sundays in Advent, we are focusing our sermon messages on these four candles we find there on the Advent wreath. Last week, you may recall, Pastor McDowell talked uh, about the first candle, which is traditionally referred to as the hope candle. And next weekend, we're going to be lighting the pink or the rose-colored candle, which is historically known as the joy candle. And then on the last weekend of Advent, just days before the celebration of Christmas, well, we'll be lighting the fourth candle, which is known as the love candle. Well, today, of course, is the second Sunday in Advent. And so today I have the joy, the privilege of talking about this second candle we find lit here on our Advent wreath, which is commonly referred to as the peace candle. So let's talk about peace here today. No doubt, uh, one of the major themes of Advent, as well as that of the Christmas season, is that idea of peace. After all, just think of all the Advent and Christmas uh, carols, hymns, songs that refer to that theme. Like, for example, the classic Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The last verse of that hymn says, Bid thou our sad divisions cease, and be thyself our king of peace. And then, of course, uh, there's the line from the Christmas carol, Hark the herald angels sing, that goes, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Oh, and then there's everyone's favorite, well, at least almost everyone's favorite, Silent Night, with those calm, soothing words, sleep in heavenly peace. And those are just a few of the many songs that pick up on this refrain of peace that is so frequently mentioned throughout the Holy Scriptures. Like, for example, in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet Isaiah refers to the Messiah as the Prince of Peace. Or the multitude of angels who sang at Jesus' birth, recorded there in Luke chapter 2, they sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And then there's our Lord Jesus himself who said in uh, John chapter 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Ah, but, but then the very next sentence regarding this peace that Jesus gives, that he leaves with us, well, Jesus says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Dear friends, you know, that's a very important modifier that Jesus uses there when it comes to understanding what true peace is. Jesus says, I do not give to you as the world gives. You see, most people tend to think of peace as the absence of conflict and struggles, right? Right? Yes, most people, in their minds, peace is often thought of as the elimination of those things which we find to be difficult and challenging and undesirable in life. And therefore, peace is often stated in these negative terms by which those things are, well, completely gone, completely eradicated from our lives. Like that of, well, no more war. No more disagreements, no more violence, no more poverty, no more disease, no more pain or sorrow, no more hurricanes or wildfires, tornadoes, earthquakes, famines, 
pestilences. No more coronavirus. Yes, the removal of all that which is bad and evil in this world is how many people would define peace. Now, friends, certainly that is part of what peace will look like and feel like someday in heaven when all that has been broken and corrupted by sin will be restored and made new again. But that's off in the future, right? So what about peace right now? Right now, when things around us are, are still broken and still corrupted by sin, is it possible for anyone to experience right now true peace? Well, my friends, the good news is, believe it or not, it is actually possible. No, I'm not saying that all the, the bad and the evil stuff in life is going to just magically disappear like that. No, but rather in the midst of those bad and evil things that we experience in this life, you and I can have peace. Yes, true, lasting, genuine peace. The kind which the Bible says transcends all understanding. You see, the peace that the Savior Jesus brings into this world is, well, it's not the absence of conflict and struggle. You're, you're not going to find that, unfortunately, in, in this fallen, broken world. No, the peace that Jesus the Savior brings is actually something even better than that. It is something that takes place within you. You see, true peace comes in having a relationship. A relationship with Jesus, with him who is greater than all the conflicts and struggles that we face in this life. True peace comes in having a relationship with the one who has met and overcome the conflicts and the struggles and difficulties that plague humanity and defeated them all, including that of death itself. And in turn, has given to us the assurance that the ultimate victory over all those conflicts and struggles and difficulties, that ultimate victory is ours. It's ours. Yes, a saving relationship with Christ Jesus is that which allows us to have peace right now. But how? How is our relationship with Christ Jesus, which does bring true peace in the midst of all the chaos going on around us, how is that relationship maintained day after day, after long, hard, difficult day. Well, my friends, our gospel reading that we heard here this morning clues us in. You see, the way we maintain our relationship with Christ and experience in real time the, the peace that comes through that relationship with him is by means of this thing which the Bible calls repentance. Repentance. Now, let me explain. You see, peace comes from a relationship with Christ, as I've been saying. But like all things in this world, yes, even that relationship can be broken. And it needs to be restored. You know, there are two extremes, you might say, that we, the children of God, can fall into that will rob us of the true peace that comes from Christ. And those two extremes would be uncertainty and complacency. Uncertainty occurs when, when we fail to understand that our sins are truly forgiven before God. Uncertainty 
questions the grace of God. And it tends to view God as one, well, who is not really for you, but is actually against you. An uncertainty like that, as I say, can damage one's relationship with the Lord and rob them of peace. Now, complacency, on the other hand, well, complacency, it questions the righteousness and holiness of God by denying the seriousness of sin in our lives. Complacency tends to see God as one who, well, simply doesn't care how you live your life as though it really doesn't matter how you live your life. You do what you please, when you please, as you please. That's complacency. And complacency can also damage your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and rob you of true peace. Ironically, both uncertainty and complacency, which seem like polar opposites, they can both rob us of experience the true peace that the Lord desires for you and me to have in our lives. And they do that because well, they both limit and minimize the relationship. That is the vital role that our Lord Jesus is to have in our lives. Because you see, as the Bible says in a place like John chapter 1, Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, he comes to us full of grace and truth. And dear friends, we need both of those in our lives. When we are uncertain, we need grace. And when we are complacent, we need to hear the truth, the sometimes painful truth. So now that we know what the problem is, be it uncertainty or complacency, or, or be it both, as is so often the case in most people's lives. Well, now that we know the problem, what then is the cure? Well, interestingly, the cure for both uncertainty and complacency, it's found, as I said, in the same solution, and that would be repentance. Repentance. And here's why. You see, according to the Bible, and this is uh, repeated for us uh, in our confirmation instruction there in Luther's small catechism. Repentance, you know, it has two parts to it. The first part is that we confess our sins to the Lord. That is, we take an honest look at ourselves and in light of God's holy word, and acknowledge that we have failed to take the sin that is in our lives seriously, as so often happens in the case of complacency. And we recognize that, well, we are in fact guilty before the Lord, and therefore deserving of his, well, his temporal as well as his eternal judgment. Confessing our sins... Friends, that's the very thing which God the Holy Spirit uses to move us from that of complacency to that of humility and sorrow over our sin. But then the second part of repentance, both are very important. The second part of repentance is that we receive the forgiveness which our Lord Jesus won for us. That is to believe, as in the case of uncertainty, to believe that the death of our Lord Jesus on the cross in our place truly covers all of our sins, covers all of them for all time. 
receiving that absolution, that is the forgiveness of our sins, be it through confession absolution, be it through the remembrance of our baptism, be it through the reception of the Lord's Supper or the reading of Holy Scripture, that is the very thing which God the Holy Spirit uses to move us from that of uncertainty in our lives to that of confidence. And dear friends, with that confidence, we have peace. Peace. No, not as the world defines it, not as the world gives it, but the true peace that comes from being in a living, breathing, day by day, real relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who truly is, as we are reminded here with his Advent wreath, the second candle, who truly is the Prince of Peace. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ our Savior. Amen.